The term living fossil is BS, and I can prove it. A living fossil is generally defined as an organism alive today, closely resembling other organisms known only from the fossil record. Usually this includes fossil organisms related to the living one. Critters called living fossils include sharks, crocs, lungfish, and horseshoe crabs. Some groups of animals have remained conservative in the shapes they take as a consequence of remaining in the same overall type of ecological niche over long periods of time. This may also be due in small part to some of these creatures evolving certain body shapes, body parts, or behaviors which are just really good at doing whatever they do. There's apparently been no reason for the group to drastically change over a long period of time. Unfortunately, some have taken this to mean that the seeming lack of change over time in some lineages disproves evolution. But this is incorrect as many creatures deemed living fossils really have changed over time though only subtly to our flawed perspectives. This can also be shown incorrect because little change over time is an example of stabilizing selection, which is the evolutionary phenomenon in which groups don't specialize often and keep their generalized characteristics, which allows many to avoid extinction. One of the many critters called a living fossil, and very much in the spirit of Shark Week, is the frilled shark an eel-shaped, many-gilled shark with a mouthful of bristly teeth. You may be familiar with this critter due to clickbait from news articles on live ones discovered every now and then, or in the thumbnails of top 10 scary undersea creature videos. There's much more to this sinuous sea serpent than its outwardly primitive appearance might suggest. Ludwig Doderlein was a German zoologist known for his work in Japan and with echinoderms. He was active from the late 1800s to the 1930s and is responsible for the naming and description of the remains of the frilled shark. Like many zoological finds, I'm sure many of the indigenous people of the area knew about the shark long before Western science recognized the beast. Around 1881, Dauderlein took two dead specimens of the frilled shark back to Vienna after his research in Japan had concluded with the full intention of describing these bizarre sharks. Unfortunately, he lost the manuscript he'd written on the specimens, and so the specimens themselves were put in the hands of a museum for someone else to do the dirty work of describing them. That scientist was Samuel Garman of Pennsylvania. Garman was an accomplished ichthyologist and herpetologist who worked under the great natural historian Louis Agassiz and was friends with, you're not gonna believe this, Edward Drinker Cope of Bone Wars fame. Many don't know, but Cope was as much an avid herpetologist of lizards and snakes as he was a paleontologist of hammer and chisel. Samuel Garman even attended fossil hunting expeditions with Cope, which puts Garman squarely in the category of guy I would have liked to know. Somehow Garman got a hold of a four-foot specimen of the frilled shark from Japan. He made observations, measurements, and descriptions of the anatomy of the specimen and published his work in a Massachusetts scientific journal. He gave the frilled shark the scientific name Chlamydocelachus anguineus, which means eel-like frilled shark, as its anatomy was so unlike anything known at the time, and to some degree to this day, the frilled shark got its own special family, the Chlamydocelacidae. In the paper on the frilled shark written by Garmin, he goes over the connection between sea serpent myths and sightings, and weird fish, which still remain unknown to science. In fact, he wrote that such animals as the frilled shark are examples of critters which might shake disbelief of sea serpents from zoologists in general, and ichthyologists in particular. Though overall anatomy of the fish is unquestionably shark-like, Garmin notes the head is so snake-like in overall shape, it easily passes as a sea serpent. Garmin also calls for the suspension of harsh judgment of sea serpent existence since there was still relatively large-bodied weirdos being discovered from the sea, despite cosmopolitan distribution of our species at the time, and our advancements in technology since the science of zoology began. I'm not so sure the same can be said today, since most large-bodied land animals have been found and described, with only a few rare stragglers left in hiding. The ocean is a whole nother animal entirely. There's still plenty of space, both known and unknown for large-bodied animals currently unknown to science to remain undetected. 
so long as they're not mammals which need to come to the surface to breathe. For a few decades after its description, the frilled shark was considered by various researchers a living member of primitive, previously assumed extinct groups of sharks. Garman thought it may be a relative to the Cladodont sharks of the Devonian period. Cladosalachi is a good example of these sharks, known for large wing-like pectoral fins and spines on the dorsal fins. The two types of animals do compare nicely together, since both have almost reptilian heads, five to seven pairs of gills, multi-bladed teeth, and sort of a longer body. That's about where the similarities end. Edward Drinker Cope and ichthyologist Theodore Gill, yeah, that's his real name, thought the frilled shark might belong to the hybodont sharks. Hybodonts were a group of sharks which lasted from the Devonian to the Miocene. At some point, I guess Cope changed his conclusion on that and put the frilled shark within the fossil genus Xenacanthus. I can see where he was going with that since both are eel-like with long sinuous bodies and a bunch of fins, but that didn't hold up to scrutiny. Turns out, the frilled shark belongs to the modern shark group Eusalachii, including all living sharks and rays. Certain anatomical characteristics put it in the group Hexanchiformes as the only other relatives to the cow sharks, the group Hexanchidae. Many researchers now think the Chlamydosilacidae of the frilled sharks are too distinct from the cow sharks to remain in the Hexanchiformes group alongside them. Instead, they might form their own order with a separate origin. As it stands, the cow shark and frill shark group represent the most primitive sharks in appearance. They haven't needed to change much of their anatomy over the millions of years. The frilled shark remained the only species of these sharks known to science until 2009, when a group of marine biologists identified, described, and classified a new species found in the waters off the coast of southern Africa. It was named Chlamydosilachus africana the Southern African Frilled Shark. It differs from the other species in size and color. The Frilled Shark prefers cooler waters and is commonly found way down deep, anywhere from 100 to 4,000 feet below sea level. Their unusual habitat includes both the outer continental shelf and upper to middle continental slope, not quite the very bottom with zero light getting through and not quite the warm shallows where reef fish are present. Their presence is worldwide, but since they don't seem to like open ocean or the bottommost layers of the ocean, there are patches of habitat ranges in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. This includes the offshore coasts of Norway, Scotland, Ireland, France to Morocco, Mauritania, Brazil, and West Africa, New England, Georgia, California, and Hawaii, Taiwan to China to Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. The frilled shark gets its common name from the appearance of its gills. The shark has six pairs of gill slits, the first of which connects together as one gill, from the side of the head across the throat as a kind of collar. The rest of the gills have bright red extended tips of fleshy filaments, which make them look frilly and thus the name. The head is another unusual aspect among sharks. Most sharks have mouths oriented downwards. Some cartilaginous fishes take this to the extreme, like rays and skates with their mouths on the bottom of their bodies. Many sharks have this downward mouth to strike at fish they come up to, while sharks like the great white have mouths oriented not quite straight down, but at like a 45 degree angle that they can change when going after things like seals, when they ram their whole head up and their jaws pop out of their skull. The frilled shark is different. They have jaws which are oriented like other fish, or even like tetrapods, just a 180 degree open and close. As far as I can tell from the literature and images of the frilled shark in action, their jaws don't accordion themselves together like other fish. When the frilled shark opens its mouth to capture prey, they don't suddenly pop forward outside of the skull. It has to open its jaws the good old fashioned way, up and down. That and the general rounded triangle shape are the reasons the critter looks more like a snake or a lizard than the sharks we familiarize ourselves with. Parting those nasty jaws will come upon the next unusual feature of the frilled shark, the teeth. The teeth of the frilled shark are trident shaped with a big central prong and two smaller side prongs. Like other sharks, the frilled shark has hundreds of teeth in conveyor belt like rows which continually push old teeth forward and out of the mouth and new teeth to replace them. 
It's partly because of those trident-shaped teeth, and partly from the rows and columns of the teeth, that make the inside of the mouth look bristly. What is it eating that it would need a bristly lizard face for? Soft and squishy things. The frilled shark's diet consists mostly of calamari. Dissecting caught specimens has proven they eat mostly soft-bodied mollusks, which they easily snag onto with their bristly teeth. Since it's rare for an animal to specialize in exactly one type of prey and avoid all others, the frilled shark also partakes in bony fish and smaller sharks. Captive sharks have been observed to hunt with their mouths wide open. By doing this, it may use the contrast between lightly colored teeth and darkly colored skin to attract prey animals towards its maw. Once the prey reaches a close enough range, the frilled shark utilizes negative pressure and sucks the prey into the mouth. The frilled shark is also known to be able to open its mouth relatively wide. This allows the shark to engulf things only a little smaller than itself, if need be. The largest sizes the living frilled sharks can get is poorly understood. The largest female frilled shark ever recorded measured at 6.6 .6 feet or 2 meters. Males tend to be smaller, and the largest male specimen ever recorded reached 5.6 feet or 1.7 meters. It's possible they can grow larger than this. Frilled sharks are aplacental viviparous. This means that the female gives live birth to pups after they've developed internally without the aid of a placenta. After copulation, the female frilled shark will produce anywhere from 2 to 15 fertilized eggs. The embryos develop inside a bladed, drill-shaped egg case, called a chondrichthys, or mermaid's purse. After a certain level of development, the mother expels the egg case, and the embryo remains inside the mother, attached to a yolk, which is its only source of nutrients. Once the pups reach anywhere from 16 to 24 inches, 40 to 60 centimeters in length, they have all the body parts they need to survive in the ocean and are born after a gestation period of three and a half years. The frilled shark isn't a living fossil. And to prove it a second time, behold, the largest of these fish to ever live, Chlamydocelachus goliath. This frilled shark is different from the modern frilled sharks in a few ways. Firstly, the holotype specimen, which came from the latest of late Cretaceous rocks of Engela, included a tooth which measures 2 centimeters in length. To put this into perspective, the teeth of modern frilled sharks reach about 0.6 centimeters. A length of this Cretaceous frilled shark was estimated from the tooth and the proportions of modern frilled sharks, as well as some of the other fossils found with the teeth. They may have reached around 6 meters, 20 feet long. The teeth were a bit different than modern varieties, suggesting a diet of less abyssal critters like fish and hard-shelled mollusks. As an animal that may not have been restricted to the depths, it might also have had a more streamlined predatory body and color patterns more akin to open water predators, as reconstructed here by Hodari Nundu. After the KT mass extinction about 66 million years ago, these giant frilled sharks went extinct, leaving smaller forms. These smaller frilled sharks were pushed out of their previous ecologies and retreated to the depths of the oceans to take up the new ecology of calamari muncher, and their anatomies evolved to cope with that. So despite what everyone parrots about these guys being unchanged living fossils, you know better. You know the truth now. Frilled sharks are just one of the many amazing ways animals have adapted to living in the depths of the oceans. What comes next on the Edge Shark Week? Maybe something bigger. Maybe something which uses its tail. Stay tuned. Subscribe to consume some delicious contento. Gore the like button, scratch out a comment, and jostle the notification bell just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. A very special thanks to my patrons Andy Volano, Rob Biondolilo, Ed Peretz, Bretzi Pizzara, Thea Svensson, Dinosaur, Natty Cat, and Dana Manchester. If you'd like to support my channel and receive some extra content, pledge to my patron at any tier you want.